Hello, students. Uh, today is uh, June the 2nd. Uh, it's 3 and 10, so we will are going to start. So, uh, we had uh, been reviewing uh, material from, from uh, ship vibrations. And today, we are going to complete this review. Okay, so we're, we are going to do, to say a couple of words about forced vibration. And then we're going to do a, a, a problem, numerical problem, and uh, about, about this topic. And then it's, it's a nice problem because it's, sometimes it's uh, used as a, in, a, in a practical sense. Okay, so let me uh, explain that. This is like an absorber. Okay, so let me go to my camera, hopefully. So uh, this is, uh, today is June, the second, and today we are going to review 1.3, which is uh, this is subchapter. It's about forced vibrations of systems with several degrees of freedom. See, since we are going to be using this for um, for ship. Uh, oscillation in waves, okay, usually the number of degrees of freedom that we want to analyze, it's, uh, it's about two, because uh, usually the, the, when we analyze the oscillation in the vertical plane, then we will have two degrees of freedom, but that's mostly what we need, okay? Uh, if you go to more advanced classes, it is quite likely that you will have to uh, analyze more uh, degrees of freedom coupled. But in our case, this is the, the maximum number. So uh, two, three, that's a good number. Okay, so in our case, it's going to be two. So um, in this case, okay, um, we have a system of ordinary differential equations, okay? Uh, when I say system, it is implicit that they, the functions that you're trying to determine are coupled, but uh, I don't want to write that, but uh, it's implicit. Makes no sense if you have N equations and they are uncoupled. That means that you can solve one by one. That, that's not much of a fun, right? It's fun when they are coupled, then that's what we mean when we have a system, okay? So uh, each one is deduced applying Newton's law, Newton's second law. Now, uh, it is possible also to deduce this equation using uh, more advanced methods, uh, Laplace's equations and things like that. That's fine. But in general, uh, in, in this class, we're going to be applying Newton's law, okay? Uh, and since we have the possibility of resonance, we have to include damping, okay? Now, remember, we have the effects, the dynamic effects that we have are first uh, the inertia, so that's the opposition, remember, opposition to acceleration. So if you try to change velocity, the inertia effect will oppose that. The other is the restoring. Uh, try to force you back to the equilibrium position. So force you, force back 
to equilibrium. Okay. Uh, did, well, we want when we said equilibrium, we want to say static equilibrium position, and not only static equilibrium, but also stable. Okay. Uh, we don't need to worry about that, but in general, uh, we can say that the equilibrium positions can, can be either stable or unstable. If it is unstable, of course, there's no way you can return to that. But in general, let's, let's leave it like that, okay? What else? Damping, as we said before, and the damping effect produces a dissipation of energy. Okay, in general, when we are here at, at the university, we don't like this effect because it uh, produces uh, some phase shift and that phase shift uh, gives us some problems when we have to calculate. But in real life, the damping will help us a lot because dissipates energy. And when you dissipate energy, that means that the energy, part of the energy, uh, mechanical energy uh, that the system can develop, it's taken away from the system. So as a result of that, we will have a reduction in amplitude of oscillation, okay? And finally, since this is forced, this chap subchapter is on forced oscillation, we will have excitation, okay? So this is, this is action, independent, independent of the motion, okay? So for example, you are, you, have, you are in a ship in the middle of the ocean and the waves come to you. And of course, the, the action of the waves will produce some excitation, forces, moments on the ship. And they don't care if you have a small yacht or a large a tanker. Waves are just acting, producing uh, forces and moments on the ship. Okay, so they don't depend on how the ship moves. They just act. So this is, this is what we mean by independent, okay? So these three will depend on the motion of the ship. The last one does not depend. If it is independent, that means that in the uh, system of equations, they will appear on the right-hand side because by uh, convention, we put anything that depends on the function that we try to determine these three terms on the left-hand side. And the excitation, which is independent, we put it to the right, okay? So, uh, so we will have something like this. So we will have A matrix, we call it a ma mass matrix. And we have, this is a vector with the accelerations. Uh, we have another matrix, that's the damping matrix, and times the velocity vector, vector. This is not a term, this is a vector, okay? Plus the restoring effect, so we present it as k times the vector of displacement. And on the right-hand side, we have, we put it like this. This is a vector of the amplitudes, and we will have the time dependence, e to the i omega t, okay? So the process, the process is, let's, since this is, uh, since this is uh, linear and all these coefficients, m, c, and k, and coefficients are constant, we can say that the solution has this form, okay? So the vector is equal to 
This is an amplitude times e to the i omega t. But this corresponds to the excitation frequency. And this is the amplitude vector. So for each one of the degrees of freedom, we're going to have an amplitude. Okay. Now, in general, this vector is uh, complex. That means that in here, we have two informations or two uh, parameters, the amplitude itself, and also we have phase shift. Okay. Uh, phase shift is very important because it can uh, allow us to interpret the, the, the response. But the problem is that the phase shift is quite difficult to measure. Okay, so it's easy to say it, but it's quite difficult if you have to find it or, or evaluate it in the real world. Okay, but in general, here, this is like complex, we can say complex amplitude vector. That means that here we have amplitude and also we will have uh, a phase shift. Okay, now, we have something like that, then if we differentiate this, we're going to have that the vector, the velocity vector is going to be i omega times the vector v e i omega t, and the acceleration vector is going to be minus omega squared v large v i omega t. So, this one here has a phase shift with respect to the vector of displacement. And this sense here has a, another phase shift. This is minus. So this is 180 uh, behind the displacement. So that's 90, that's 180 behind that. Okay? Now, if we have these ex three expressions, we can replace them in the system of equations of, uh, of motion. We can replace this because there's three, one, two, three uh, functions or group of functions in our system of motion equations. So instead of this, we're going to set minus omega squared times V. I omega, V, and V. So at the end, we're going to have, in the three terms, we're going to have V, and we can take that as a common factor. So we're going to say that this is um, a large combining matrix. This is equal to minus M, omega squared plus C I omega plus K. So M, C, and K are N by N. So if you combine these three matrix, of course, this large matrix, uh, it's going to be also N by N. Here we will have the vector V, this, this, and that times i omega t, this is an scalar, and on the right-hand side, we're going to have the vector of amplitude of excitations times i to the omega t. We can recognize that we can cancel that, so at the end, we can solve this system of equations in a very simple way, because uh, we can obtain the inverse of that and go on with our calculations, okay? Now, um, uh, this is what we call the dynamic matrix. Usually we put it like D and we want to emphasize that here we have omega and there too. So this dynamic matrix in general depends on the on the frequency, okay? So, uh, after we cancel that, uh, we can say that in general, 
the amplitude, vector of amplitude, that's what we want to determine, is going to be what? We put this on the right-hand side, and we say that that's equal to the, the inverse of, of, of D times the vector F, okay? Now, uh, this is just a very general way of uh, explaining the process, okay? But basically, that's what we're going to do, okay? Uh, when you see this equation, you say it's quite simple. Yeah, well, it is simple. The only difficulty, or, or yeah, you can call it like that, is that D in general is a complex. It's a complex matrix. So uh, we have to be careful when we calculate the inverse of a complex matrix. Now, in Excel, you have, you can uh, define variables in as complex, okay? And also modern languages of programming allow you to uh, define variables as complex. So this process can be calculated easily. After, after you do this process, of course, you can get the amplitudes of this, uh, each one of the degrees of freedom, and also you can determine the, the phase shift, I mean, how they are uh, behind or ahead of the excitation. Okay, now, it, just one, one simple thing. I mean, if you have something like this, you could uh, vary the, the frequency of excitation. So, and you can have, for example, the amplitude of each one of the, the, the degrees of freedom. Now, if you have the, this, the inverse, okay, this, to calculate the inverse, you are gonna have, for example, remember the, in the case two by two, the inverse of a, of a two by two is equal to one over the determinant, and then you, you change the positions and the signs of the, of the elements of the matrix. But you divide, to calculate this, you divide by the determinant. The problem is that if you divide that by the determinant, there are certain uh, values of omega that makes the, the, the value of the determinant very small. I'm not saying zero because here we have the damping. If we had no damping, we can say that the determinant of this uh, uh, inverse or the determinant of the matrix, when we take the value of each one of the natural frequencies will be zero. So if we have here the first natural frequency, the second natural frequency and so on, see, for each one of these, the determinant of the dynamic matrix will reduce in its value. If that reduces in value, in general, that will be in the denominator, this uh, inverse will produce a very large values of V. That means that every time we get close to that, we're going to have an increase in response. Then we have to produce another increase and so on. So I did something that we uh, described in, uh, in sheet vibration. See, we have one resonance, we have resonances at each natural frequency, okay? And uh, uh, usually this is the way they, they, they present. When you go to the right, uh, in general, you will expect to have the amplitude will be smaller than if you had resonance with one of the lower natural frequencies. Why is that? That's usually because F here, you will need to have a, an F distribution in such a way that you can excite the, the higher uh, modes of oscillation. And that's usually not uh, very common, okay? And the other thing is that here you have the frequency and that's multiplied by the damping matrix. And remember that the damping 
it's uh, taken away from the oscillation of the system energy. It's dissipating energy. So if you increase omega, that means that this, this term will be higher. That will mean at the end that the, the, the damping, it's taking more and more energy off, out of your oscillation. Okay, so in general, we can say that the resonances with the lower natural frequency will be very dangerous. And as you go and you increase the, uh, the resonance situation, um, the response will be smaller and smaller. Okay, so we have to be very concerned about having a resonance with the first two of the second uh, natural frequency. If you have a resonance with the 11th natural frequency, probably I wouldn't expect that much of a problem, okay? But that's the general, the general process. Okay, I don't know if there are any questions about this. I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, you want to raise uh, your hand if you have any question? I do have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, how do you spell phase phase shift? How do you spell that? Okay. Uh, yeah. So in in V, we have uh, in this vector we have. I'm going to write it completely. We have amplitude and phase. Shift, S H I F T S, phase shift. So we said it's like uh, being behind, that the response is supposed to be behind the excitation. Okay, so uh, when uh, you have this, the system and the excitation starts acting on the system, the system takes some time to respond to the excitation. That means that the, he's uh, slow to the response, so it it's, gets gets behind. And that amount of getting behind, that's what we call the phase shift. Okay, that's that's the way we write it. Thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, so why don't we do one example? That's that's the example I wanted to 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 do. Okay, so. Uh, and we are going to do in a very, in a different way. Okay, so uh, let's suppose that we have uh, something like this. We have a bar pinned on the left, and we have a vertical spring in here, and we have an excitation here. This is a moment. So we have m0 e to the i omega t okay so this is let's suppose that this is l over 2 this is also l over 2 and this is k let's call it k1 okay so i'm going to give you uh, some up uh, what about four or five minutes in order to deduce the differential equation of motion for this uh, for this system, okay? So uh, to avoid <laughs> having different uh, perspectives, let's consider the degree of freedom, the function that describes the position of this system. We're going to take that angle, and that angle we're going to call it theta, which depends on time. Okay, so if you want, this is the reference system, X, Y, and this is Z. So the rotation goes in the C direction, okay? So please, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes uh, to deduce the, the equation of motion of this uh, problem, and then I'm, you tell me and I'm going to write it down. So please go on. Remember that uh, if we need the differential equation, that you need to do is to draw a free body diagram.
So let's suppose that we start from the horizontal position. This is our uh, static equilibrium equal, uh, position. That means that in this position, if you want to consider the weight, okay, the weight is acting here, but also you have the force because of the spring and also because the force at the pin. Okay, so all these static forces are canceled be, uh, between them. Okay, so summation of forces in the vertical direction, this the pin and the, the weight, they cancel. So measure of moments, they also cancel. Okay? And let's suppose that after canceling, this is the position that we reach. Okay? Now, this is the uh, function that we want to determine. Okay? What we have to do is we take the system there. And I'm always insist on this, this thing. You have to displace the system in the positive direction that you have defined it. So that's why I go against the, or counterclockwise. So probably you remember the, some of the, um, the comments that we made in, in cheap vibration. Okay, so here we have this force pointing downwards and on the left end in, in the point O, remember that when we uh, put the point O, we usually mean that that point doesn't move. So we're going to have forces. This is the uh, reference system. So if we don't know something, we better put it in the, in the positive uh, direction. So this is going to be the reaction in the vertical direction. It's going to be the reaction in the horizontal direction. And this force here, because of the spring, is going to be pointing downwards if this is positive. So in the, in the, the amplitude of this is going to be K1 times this vertical displacement, if theta is small, we can put it like this. Okay? So we can go on and set summation of moments with respect to O. This is fixed. This is something that we reviewed uh, two classes ago. And we said that if that is, uh, that is fixed, we can say that this is equal to J0 and the acceleration. So we're taking a, a, an axis through this point, I'm sorry, through this point, and we're going to take moments with respect to that axis. The axis is perpendicular to the plane and passes through point O. Um, since all the moments in this case are perpendicular to the plane, we take only the amplitudes. But this is a vector relation, okay? If you want, this is multiplied by K. But we are taking only the, the amplitudes, okay? That K, that's in the Z direction. So, if that's correct, that's the uh, positive direction, which is consistent with that. Now, what forces do we have? We have that and that, but that, they don't have arms. So this is the only one. So it's going, we're going to say that is minus K1 theta L over two. That's, that's the, the force. And we have to multiply by L over two, which is the arm. So that force times this is equal to the moment. That's the only thing that we have. That's equal to J zero theta double dot. I'm sorry, we have the excitation. M of T. Okay. 
negative. Uh, doctor? Because I draw it like that. Yes? Yes. Yes? Is there any question, yes. please? Go no. on. No question? No. Okay. So, remember, this is something which is quite common, okay? You have theta, that's the function that we're trying to determine. And we have here, this is the next citation, which is this term. And this term, the excitation, is independent of theta. This do not depend on theta. Theta will be the response to this excitation. So we try to insist on that. So we put all the terms that have that has theta or its derivative to the left, and the rest, which are independent, we put it to the right. So this one here will be combined with that one. Those two will be on the left. And this one will be on the right. Okay, so um, we're going to say that J0 theta squared plus K1 L over 2 squared theta is equal to minus the moment which depend on the time. I put this on the right. This, these two have positive sign. This has negative sign and then just switch places. Is that what you have? People? Is that what you have? Yeah. Good. Yes. Good. I'm glad. Now, uh, we can calculate that and we can draw Please remember, this is the function, this is the amplitude of that. And we can uh, determine the uh, amplitude of the response. And of course, when we have the natural frequency, we're going to have, in this case, that we do not have a, a damping, the response is going to go to infinity. Okay, so that's subchapter one one. Now, let's suppose, let's suppose that for some reason we have that uh, in the general conditions we have a resonance. I mean, the excitation is very close to the natural frequency. Okay, so we have uh, an excitation frequency which is very close to this value. Okay, uh, so we have this system, the excitation has a frequency which produces a very large response. What can we do? Uh, well, there are many ways, many things that we can do. And we can try to change K1, we can try to change the, the mass. Let's, let's consider another thing. Okay, and one uh, option that we may have is that if we had a resonance in normal conditions, okay, we, we may try to add an absorber. So that the oscillation of the main system is reduced. So an absorber is basically and a small mass, attach it to the original system. And we have to, we can uh, adapt the, this uh, little system in such a way that the main system, which is the one which we are interested, 
the response of that is reduced. And for example, in this case, that's the problem that we want to solve. We have that there, okay? That's the original system. And what we're going to do, I'm going to write it with uh, green. Hopefully you can recognize the difference with green. Okay, so what we're going to do is to attach here something like that. So this is going to be attached to our system through a spring. So in general, this, this, the, the stiffness of that is different to that. And of course, the, the mass of this one will be different to that one. Okay, so in this problem, what we want to do is if, we still have the excitation. And what we want to do is, let's suppose that uh, we have the original system, the excitation, and we, we suspect that if we install a mass N2, we are able to reduce the resonance situation, okay? And the, the problem is, but we must find K2 in such a way that this reduction can be produced. Okay, that's the problem. Okay, now, uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, what we can do is this. Uh, I'm going to take a break, it's, it's 3.51. And in the meantime, please, you may go on trying to accept the uh, equations of motion of this system, okay? Remember that uh, this is the reference system that we're using. So the rotation is positive in that direction and the displacement, because we need to specify the displace, displacement for M2, has to be positive in the upward direction. Okay? Okay, let's, let's continue. Uh, we have, uh, in this case, uh, we have two degrees of freedom, one is the theta, that's the original one, but now we have another mass M2 here, and we are going to express the displacement of this one here using V of T, so we have two degrees of freedom, okay? Uh, so uh, we need the free body diagram again, so, uh, So we have the horizontal there. This is uh, fixed. And the position, it's, uh, let's, let's mark it like this one here. Okay, now we go to that one. So that is theta. And this uh, element here, it uh, has moved upwards an amount V. So these are displacements, okay? And, uh, with the black, I'm going to present forces. Uh, similarly done before, we have that one, and we said that that's equal to K1 times half L times theta. Okay, now we're showing forces on the bar. Now, the problem here, remember, is that this end moves upward because the rotation theta, but also the, this other end, see, the other end here also moves upward an amount V of T. So uh, what we can do in these cases, in some, some case uh, you, you can get confused, is this up, uh, upward or downwards? So in those cases, remember that this is a linear problem, okay? So uh, if this moves up upward, we can think for a second that this block doesn't move. So if this rotates, we can say that the force, because the, the spring has stretched, pulls 
the system downwards. And this force will be K2 times theta L. So that's considering that only the bar rotates and the, the block doesn't move. And now we change and we say, okay, now the bar stays horizontal and the block moves upward. If that's the case, uh, the spring is compressed. And if the spring is compressed on the, on the bar, the force will be upward and the value will be K2 times V. So you have the combination of the two. So the combination will be in the upward direction. So it's going to be K2 times V minus theta Okay, so again, if you have these situations when both ends move, it is sometimes, not always, but sometimes can get confused about the sign. In, in the linear cases, what you can do is take one action at a time. In this case, uh, this is the uh, force developed by the spring on the bar, when only the bar rotates. And that's the force developed by this spring when the bar doesn't move and the block, this block here moves upward and amount V, okay? Now, in the other end, in the other end, the spring will generate the force on the block in the opposite direction. So we're going to have this force that will have the opposite direction, but the amplitude will be the same. So it's going to be K2 V minus theta L. So this force here will be on the bar and this force here will be on the block. Please, any questions about this process? Questions about this? No? Okay. Um, so we have, this is point O, summation of moments on the bar is going to be J zero times that. So that's positive. See, remember, this is our reference system. So rotation is positive in that direction, counterclockwise. So we put an axis there. So that's in the opposite direction. So we said minus K1 half L theta. Remember that we have M here, minus M. But now we have this force in the end. So that force will point in the positive direction. So it's going to be plus K2 V minus theta L, that's force. Oh, here we're missing, that's moment, sorry. And here we have to multiply by L because that's the arm. And the result with V is going to be that. And the other question is going to be summation of, mom, of forces in the y direction is going to be the mass two times the acceleration. So this is on the block. So the block is here. There. So we have only one force and that force is pointing in the negative direction. So we can say is that minus K2 V minus theta L minus, and that will produce an acceleration of the block. So what we can do now is just to, to include all the terms or to put all the terms which depend on theta or V on the left, because those are the functions that we're trying to determine. And everything else will be on the right hand side. In this, in this case, the moment will be on the right hand side. 
Okay, so we, this is first equation, the second equation. Uh, so here we have, uh, we put it on the right-hand side, we said J zero, second derivative, that's that. Theta is here and there. See, this is negative, this is negative. When we put it to the right, it's going to be positive, so it's going to be plus theta. Uh, K2, L squared from this one. And from here, it's going to be plus K1, L over two squared. So that's that one. So we'll move it to the right. Okay, that's a negative, and the M is going to have, it's going to stay on the left-hand side, there. So that's equation one. Well, I'm missing something here. Yeah, this is this, I'm missing this term. Uh, so <laughs> I'm missing is V, if I put it on the left-hand side, it's going to be minus, V times K2 times L. So that's moment, 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 force, moment, and moment. Yes, I'm sorry about this. The other equation is from this thing here. You see that it has V, theta, and V. So this is going to be a homogeneous equation. So the second equation is going to be M2, acceleration, that term. Uh, this one here on the right-hand side is going to be plus K2V. This is positive, so it's going to be negative. On the other side, it's going to be uh, K2L, K2L times V, and that's, I'm sorry, but theta. That's going to be zero. So that's force, that's force, that's force, this is non-dimensional. So that's equation. Okay, uh, in this case, what we're trying to determine is, let's suppose that we have, uh, let's suppose that we are given M2. So the mass of the block is given. Or in some cases, for example, uh, I'm, I'm gonna present an example. It's, it's practical to say, okay, I can add a small mass of a certain value, but that's all what I can do, okay? And then what we can do is, given this M2, we are asked to determine the value of K2. Okay, in this case, this is a simplified case. We have no damping, okay? Damping would be, would put some extra uh, algebraic difficulty, but that's all. The process will be the same. So what do we want to obtain? What we want to obtain is theta to be, if possible, be zero. So with this excitation, the only thing that would be happening is that this, this thing, the, the, this block will be oscillating, but that's all. Okay. Now, let's go on. Uh, if this is a linear system, okay, and the coefficients are constant, okay? In that case, we have on the right-hand side this type of term. So on the left-hand side, we can assume that the solution, remember the solution is a combination of two uh, functions, theta and V, which depend on time. So we can assume that both has this form, e to the i omega t. So since this is a linear system and the coefficients are constant, we can assume that the combination of the two, theta, which depend on time, 
and V, which depend on time, are equal to. This is a constant, probably a, a complex constant. This is large V amplitude times E to the I omega T. So in this case, the, the accelerations, in this case, we have here and here we have the accelerations. The acceleration is going to be, um, I'm running out of space here, minus omega squared. There. And here I have theta and large v. OK, now, what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite these two relations, two equations, in matrix form. We're going to replace this into that, and we will see what we can do. The, the, remember that the objective is try to find K2 in such a way that theta is small. So that we used to have a very complex problem here, and we're trying to solve that problem attaching this absorber. That's, that's the idea. So uh, let's write this in, comp in uh, matrix form. We have this and thus, those two uh, inertia terms. So we will say that that's equal to J0 and 2, 0, 0, times acceleration, acceleration. There. We have restoring effect. So in the first term, we have this theta, k1 at half L squared, k1 has half L squared plus k2 L squared, which is this one, and this multiplied by theta. So that's there. And here, something which is multiplied by V is, is this one, minus k2 L, minus k2 L. And then the right-hand side, well, let, let's complete this. To avoid confusions, we identify rows and columns like that. And in the second equation, from the second equation, we have these two terms, which are multiplied by V and theta. So, uh, oh, multiplied by V is uh, K2. So this is K2, and multiplied by theta is minus K2L. So it's minus K2L there. Sorry. And finally, on the right-hand side, we have the terms which do not depend on theta or V. So here, this term doesn't depend on neither one of them. The other is zero. So it's going to be um, minus M zero, zero, e to the i omega t. So that's, that's the equations of motion in matrix uh, form. We replace this into here. We replace this into here, and we recognize that we have this term on the two. Uh, and this one here, we're going to have minus omega squared. So we can say that this is uh, minus omega squared j0 plus this term. So it's going to be plus k1 l over 2 squared k2 l squared. The other term is going to be zero, and then it's going to be minus k two l. This one here is going to be zero minus k two l. And here we're going to have this one, but multiplied by on minus omega squared, so it's going to be minus omega squared m two 
plus a two there. That's multiplied by the amplitude theta times V. And on the right hand side, it's going to be minus M zero, zero. The E to the I omega T on, on both sides, we cross them out. So it's, it doesn't appear in here. Uh, and uh, please notice uh, this is an algebraic relation. See? You see that in, in this relation, in this equation, there is no time dependence. The time dependence was canceled on both sides because in here, here, and here, we have the EI omega t. So we cross from the three terms. So this is just algebra. Questions about that? Questions about of this process so far? No, good. So, uh, remember in the, probably one of your, your classes in, in high school, you try to solve that, you say theta and V is going to be the inverse of that, okay? Let's put it like this, times minus M zero times zero. What's the inverse? The inverse is going to be one over the determinant times what? This is only for the two by two matrix, okay? Which is something very common. What you do is you change places of the two elements in the main diagonal. So here you have D2, two, two, and the D11 one, one comes to the other place. And the others out of the main uh, diagonal, you change sign. Okay, so this term was D12, first row, second column, and you simply change its sign. And here you have second row, first column, and you change sign. So you can check that if you multiply this by the times the original matrix, and the result will be the identity matrix. Okay. No questions so far? Good. So let's apply this for our relationship. But now we can see is that this is multiplied by this vector minus M zero times zero. And that's equal to theta times V. So, if this is zero, what you have to do is multiply this term by the first row. So we can say that theta and V are going to be one of the determinant times, uh, well, minus M zero, we can take that out as a constant, times D two two and minus D two one there. Now, what is it that, that we're looking for? Well, we're looking for is the value of K2 in such a way that theta is very small. And we can see in this matrix, this is D22, which is this term here. So this is D22. This is D11, D12, D21, D22. And we can see that if D22 were very small, that multiplied by this one is the amplitude of theta. So if this is zero, the amplitude would be zero. We see that if D22 where zero, the amplitude of theta would be zero also. So let's make d22 equal to zero, and we can see here. So d22, 
and this is equal to minus omega squared times m2 plus k2. And from here, we can determine that uh, k2 is going to be omega squared times m2. Okay. Um, we can try to, to, to see if we could combine the two results, like this one here, and we will see that we can plot theta as a function of omega. And what we're going to have is around the original frequency, omega, which was causing a lot of problems, we're going to have something like this. So, uh, comparing So let's suppose that we have the original system was something like this. Okay. And now when we select the, the stiffness of the of the spring, of the second spring uh, that connects the absorber with the, the, the system, theta would be very small. So what happens is simply is that now the system has two degrees of freedom. So we're going to have probably to the left of this one, we're going to have a first natural frequency and the second natural frequency. These are the natural frequencies of the system plus the absorber. So we're going to have something like this. About here, we're going to have a resonance, same thing here. So we're going to have something like this, like that. So we install an absorber in such a way that when we had resonance, we're going to have, we're going to have a very small response. And uh, what has happened is that the system has been transformed into a two degrees of freedom system. In this region, we expected the reduction in response because it's between the two resonance regions. This is what we take advantage of. This is a system, this, uh, this is something that we uh, see in some cases. We add an absorber in such a way, if we are smart enough, in such a way that uh, we have a reduction in response of our system. Uh, to complete this, uh, for example, in, in, the, in the ship, we can have something like this. Okay, this is the ship which is, oscill is oscillating in waves. So it started oscillating like theta. But what you can do is you can include an U2. This is the absorber. So the water in here starts oscillating like that. This could be your V of T. See, the position of the free surface of the, of the water in the tank could be the, the second, uh, the second degree of freedom. So in this case, you have one and two. If you have more water on one side, that will produce a moment on the system, on the ship. So what we can do is do something like this. Okay, analyze these two degrees of freedom system and add this tube with an exactly amount of water in such a way that there will be a reduction in theta which is something that you want, okay? Uh, so this is an application. Uh, some years ago, we developed a, 
graduation project with the engineer Sarate, Leonor Sarate, and we did some tests in the in the lake. Uh, and we had a model and we included a U tank, so it was fun. But yeah, that's uh, an example of that. And this is now a two degrees of freedom system with uh, an excitation. Now, um, let me share with you. So, uh, the first problem is just a, I want you to, to, to see something more realistic. And uh, yeah, we don't have the opportunity to develop this on the, in the real world, but that's why I made this uh, small video of this uh, swinging toy. So I just want to explain me how come you have an oscillatory motion out of there. This is very nice because they will force you to, to apply the summation of, mo of moments. This is a one degree of freedom system, problem four. And then problem five, it's more like a, the ship. Okay, we have a, a, a rigid bar and the mass will be assumed to be uh, approximated with these four concentrated masses, M1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, the system will be supported by two springs, K2, K1, and also there will going to be two um, uh, dumping, dumpers. Here, I try to draw the spring and the damper, and the spring and the damper. So you have the K1 is the stiffness of the spring, and C2, C1 is the constant of the damper, similar for the other end. Okay? So in this case, you have excitation in the vertical direction and also rotation. So it's a moment. Okay? So I want you to solve this problem. Again, prepare a free body diagram, define your uh, reference system. Remember, when you have moments, it's a good idea to check that X plus Y give you Z. X plus Y gives you Z. Because otherwise you can have problems with the sign. And we go on similarly as we have done today. Um, if there are any problems, any questions, let me know and uh, I'll try to guide you as much as I can. A question. Yeah. So, but it's not about the video, it's about the last problem. Okay. Um, so when you were explaining on last, last, ses like last session, you were saying we have to um, express N, N3 has a combination of N3, N5, and the distance from the midship to the center of gravity, right? Yeah. So we have to do a draw C vector as we were doing on the last, last two yeah. classes. Yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, but see, what I suggest is that, let me write here, okay? What I suggest is this, okay? Um, um, let's suppose that this is the chip. And I'm going to draw down here. This is the centroid of the system. So row C is supposed to be from here to there. So row C it's a vector. And what I, so what I suggest is to assume that it will be, the center of gravity will be at, at midpoint of this height. So it's going to be X, G times I. So it's going to be just at the same level. So there will be no vertical component to make things more simple. Okay, so let's simplify that, okay? And this is something that we will be doing also in the ship case. And in the ship case, of course, it's, we have something like this.
In some cases, for, for example, you can say that's the case. And that is your row C. And you see that it's an X component and also a small vertical component. But we're going to neglect this. And that's what I'm suggesting here. So assume that the row C has only X component. to calculate the, the, the product, the, the, the vector, vector product. Melendez? Mm, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? If there are more questions, send me an email and I'll try to answer as soon as possible, okay? If there are no more questions, so I'll see you Thursday. Be careful. All right. Sounds good. Bye -bye Thank now. you. Take care. Bye.